first of all, um, this demonstration has been arranged by the government of and also yeah. in partnership with uh, We are part of the largest professional martial arts organisation in the world, which is the European Women's Channel Organisation, of which we teach many of the weapons side for this organisation. So, to introduce us, this is Master Dillman, who is the Chief Instructor for the European Air Weapons System, so to speak. Well done, Bill. This is Hello, William. Steve Kimby, who's been the martial arts and teaching in England for over 20 years and is part of the organisation. I shall leave Jonathan to introduce himself in a moment. I'm Steve Tapping, and I've been doing martial arts since 1972, and I'm also part of the organisation. The demonstration is in two parts. The first part being medieval weapons techniques and the second part being a more modern version towards the police forces of modern day and that's to show the relevance of understanding what our past masters have done to today's society. I'll have you right now to jump in. Good afternoon. Okay. Um, I make my living yeah. five days a week teaching combat mainly at theatre schools in London um, but I've always had an interest and a love of history and discovering how things work. Um, I've been greatly aided in that by my father, John Waller, who is now Head of Interpretation of the Royal Armouries Museum, where they're carrying on an active program of researching and interpreting historical methods of wearing armour, riding horses and fighting with different kinds of weapons. When I say interpretation, I would like to describe or explain what I mean by interpretation. Uh, we're very lucky, certainly with 14th and 15th century combat techniques, and then we had the survival of a number of combat manuals that were written and illustrated in many cases <coughs> by fight masters, from, mainly from Europe, mainly Germany and some from Italy. Uh, and so what we're going to do today, this afternoon, is show you some of the concepts and techniques that these fight masters taught and used and put down into their fight manuals. And then just to explain briefly the uh, background of some of these fight masters. There are a number, as I say, we have at least 15 surviving copies of different fight manuals. We're going to be concentrating on mainly two of these fight masters. Uh, one Italian, Fiore de Libre, whose manuscript was written in 1409, and a German called Hans Helhofer, whose manuscripts were very popular and were actually reprinted a number of times from the 1440s onto the 1460s. Um, these fight masters generally would make their day-to-day -day living from teaching wherever their services were required, be it in a village green or in a town square. But principally, they would always look to have the nobility for patronage and to use their skill of teaching the sons of dukes or noblemen if they were very lucky to royalty. And as I say, the Italian fight master, Fiore de Libre, uh, dedicated his fight man in 1409 to the Destes, who were the Lords of Ferrara at that time, and again seeking royal patronage for his work. Um, although these fight masters taught many techniques, including wrestling, fighting with pole axes, with knives, on horseback, uh, occasionally armoured combat, but also unarmoured combat, which is what we're going to be showing you today, the main weapon that they focused on in all of these fight manuals is the two handed sword. Some of the manuals don't include uh, the wrestling techniques, others have more wrestling techniques, but what is common to all the fight manuals and to all these fight masters is that they taught the use of the two-handed sword, which was considered by many to be the chief mighty weapon, certainly in parts of Germany and Italy. So what we'd like to do now is just describe a few of the techniques that they, they taught, uh, which are common to all these fight masters. Uh, again, hopefully dispelling the myth that it was the strongest person with the heaviest sword that won the fight. There are a sort of fairly standardised series of techniques that we used, and hopefully we'll be able to get some of these across. Um, the main thing they taught, or the main difference why people might notice, is that when you compare it to modern day fencing, modern day fencers tend to move in a straight line, because modern day fencing is a sport. What most of these masters thought you would do offline or move away from the direction of the attack. 
So, for example, if Steve were to cut my head, I would step away diagonally, walking him up to an attack to be killed, thereby taking the force away from his blow by getting closer to it, but also deflecting the energy away from it. The principal part of the sword that they use, obviously, was the edge. And they do they have a number of cutting blows, but also cuts and thrusts. That's not to say that they didn't use the other parts of the sword. They would often, if they got in close, grab the sword blade, which, although it was sharp, was not razor sharp, and was not dangerous to the hand, providing you didn't slide your hand along the blade, so they could come in and use it like a bed. They could also use the pommel for its weight to strike blows, and also the cross guard to act like an axe or the hook. However, the main concept or the idea behind the movements was not necessarily to kill your opponent, but to stop your opponent from killing you. And so to achieve that end, they would often employ disarming moves and also locking techniques that would incapacitate the opponent, but would not necessarily kill him. So, for example, if Steve were to thrust at me, I could move out of the way, secure his sword with my left hand, whilst threatening him with my sword. If he tries to pull it away, I've got the option to thrust, or I can keep him there and pull it out of his hand. If, Steve, uh, if I were to attack Steve, he could put a lock on me, securing my arm, and that's rendering me incapable of actually hurting him, again, without actually killing me. Let's go back on myself slightly. We now do a short interpretation, as it may have appeared during a training session, a series of movements which we have taken from these manuscripts and have interpreted in our way from the writings of these masters and into what they actually did. We will do it at a, say, at a reasonable training pace, and then we will slow it down and break it down so that you hopefully can understand what we're doing. Right, now to break it down. First of all, we assume two wards or guards which are starting positions. They're not positions that to be used purely defensively, but they're positions to launch attack from. Oh. I see Jonathan is vulnerable towards the stomach area, so I trust his victory. I offline first, taking myself away from the line of the attack, and defend myself to make sure. This opens up Steve's left leg to an attack as they come round with a cut. Hmm? I take a step back to keep my legs safe. This exposes Jonathan's head, for which I didn't point my left attack. Again, I offline and flex his sword away from me, coming around, cutting for his neck. I step back again, to drop, and I go start, which is moving the sword out of the way, to expose Jonathan's picture again, and thrust. I move away, deflect it, come back to Steve's head, he beats the sword away, and then we have an impasse. Neither of us have an advantage, so we back off and get to start again. Again, we like to show this again at a slightly faster speed, so again, so now you've seen the moves at a slower speed, you might be able to understand it. I hope there's no blood. Yeah, I think we should have <laughs> But certain attacks don't always lead into certain defences, and that isn't a necessary a set pattern. If Steve is to change his attack just slightly, by this time, he's going to, instead of thrusting from my stomach, thrust to my leg, it will force me to move in different ways. I'd just like to show you that. And again, to break it down and hopefully convey the ideas. Oh, this time, the first attack didn't work. My man got three to leg. Because he's gone for my leg, I can't step across into it because he will probably still stab me, so I step away behind myself and deflect his sword. Again, cutting for his left leg. I again take a step back to defend my leg. This again exposes Donovan's head for the time. Because I've got more space this time, I can now step to my right to try a different kind of attack, but still cutting around for his neck. I step back to defend myself. We start again to move Jonathan's sword out of the way. This exposes his midriff to my attack. Because I'm beating it now to my left, it causes me to do a backhand slash across his stomach. And I'm going to watch it. Again, we have an impasse with neither of us having the advantage. Right, then one more time again with a reasonable training speed, hopefully to make more sense.
Yes. Slightly different series of movements, this time hopefully with uh, Bill to show different parts of the sword being used, and the sword being used in a different way, not just with using the edge to cut with, or the point of the thrust. Positions. Although I'm in a, uh, a starting position which lends me most readily to do a thrust, I do the unexpected and use it to deliver a cut. I immediately move out of the way and Jonathan's head is exposed. Come in, aim for the head. I offline to again to get away from the danger and to deflect his sword and then cut the bill's head. Who also offlines and gets out of the way. I immediately, Jonathan's head is exposed and I slash into his head. Then I glee side his sword to try and tie him up and thrust him for his stump. I offline, move it away, grasp the sword and not side and axe his head. He blocked and pull him off and thrust to his face. So I step away, letting go of the sword so he doesn't pull me into it and deflect his sword, uh, his pommel away from me with my free left hand, again leaving his stomach open to a thrust. I am moving you offline, across the glissar, over, smash the stroke. I jump away, and again his stomach's a nice open target, so I come in with a thrust. Offline, smashing to the throat with the pommel. Right, and again, at a reasonable training speed. What's reasonable? <laughs> <laughs> we'll see. We'll see. <laughs> thing you will be carrying about you, with you every day. It's going to get it away and hanging at your waist. However, the sword and buckler was. It gave you the defensive uh, qualities of a shield for taking up less space, to be worn at the belt. The broad sword is a single-handed sword which can be carried far more easily. If this was considered to be a knightly weapon, then the sword and buckler, certainly in England, it was a weapon combination of the common man, the soldier, the archer. It was often used on the street. Uh, you've probably all heard of the phrase, he's a swashbuckler. This comes from the use of this weapon. Medieval word, or the use of the word for swash, was to swagger. And the men were well, aware their bucklers hanging over the hilts of their swords, and as they swaggered or swashed down the road, their bucklers would rattle against the sword, drawing attention to them. Again, as I say, it was a young man's weapon, so it's young men showing off. I shouldn't really be doing this. Plus, <laughs> <laughs> when did anybody go to swashbucklers? They couldn't get any other mad people. <laughs> right. Bill and Steve now give you a short demonstration. size and its construction, which is made out of metal, the buckler can be used defensively to deflect the opponent's sword, but also offensively to deliver powerful and devastating punches. Then the, the, Bill and Steve will go through the routine slowly and I will describe what they're doing. That was fun. <laughs> Again, they both assume starting positions, holding the bucklers in front of them to restrict the target areas on their own body. Steve thrusts with Bill's stomach, Bill moves offline, Deflecting Steve's sword with the buckler, which in turn leaves Steve's stomach exposed to Bill's thrust. Steve offlines and deflects Bill's sword down, which is now opened Bill to an attack, so Steve comes in with a cut. Again, Bill deflects it using the buckler, opens Steve up to a cut, which forces Steve to block with both weapons to make sure. Steve thrusts, and again is deflected away from his body by Bill, 
with then thrust, causing Steve to move at an unusual angle, but he has to because he's in danger. And then a punch comes in, which Bill stops with his back. Again, at a reasonable training speed, hopefully to make some sense of the... Their understanding of movement, their attitude, their intention, perhaps this swagger gave them confidence. We now want to put these lessons and find a way of using them in today's society. So, <coughs> many policemen now are not allowed to do their job. They can no longer hit somebody who's hitting them. It's a very strange scenario that people can hurt each other and everybody else and these people are sent to protect us and they're not allowed to do their job. So with this in mind, we reintroduced the buckler so the policemen feel confident. It's not threatening, it's not intimidating, but it inspires confidence. So we take these drills, this attitude, for the everyday policemen on the beat. We're not talking about riot control, what we've done is individual combat, single combat, training for single combat, and therefore we are thinking about the policeman who's walking on the beat, who could be attacked or has to go into a dangerous situation, be attacked by a dog who can put the buckler out, be attacked by drug addicts, knives, sticks, whatever. We will go through these different scenarios in a moment, no last little bit. We are trying to make the best out of history. Are you trying to tell me that <laughs> So, we hope that you will see the relevance of our understanding of interpretation, not just to be historians or so we can wear twats, <laughs> but also to actually put it into use and also to show that really nothing changes that much. We can learn from the past if we understand it and think how they form. So, if a young man walked down with confidence to spit a field market, to go to a competition or to see a duel, or just to walk down and meet his friends to have a drink, perhaps the policeman will have the same inspiration to go there.